Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just open the chat here. Okay. <clears throat> so how is everybody doing today? Perfect. Uh, let me just share my screen with you. Hey. Share. So we can see this well. Perfect. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start our first chapter in flood mechanics today. Uh, we had some introduction about the topic uh, uh, last time and we just quickly go over like, you know, why we are concerned with studying flood mechanics. And I, and I described fluids uh, very quickly uh, last time, but today we're gonna understand a little bit more on why gas and liquids are um, defined under the flood mechanics um, uh, category and why it's different to handle flood mechanics analysis and uh, different from the solid mechanics. Uh, I've seen people here asking some question about the slides before. Uh, you can do that, yes, uh, no problem. I will, I will do that from uh, starting from next time. Uh, so if you want to take some notes, it would be, uh, I think, better this way, right? I will do that. Um, people asking, still asking about tutorial and lab. Uh, yes, this week there is uh, trial tutorials, and I, and I guess some of you guys already started um, attending some of those sections and trying the, the, you know, the stuff that we were talking about last time about breaking up room and talking to the TA through this. And so I, I hope it went, it went fine. Uh, some of you still maybe have a uh, tutorial today and uh, tomorrow as well. So um, uh, yeah. So let me start talking about uh, our topic of today. So let me just do this. So flood mechanics, and I mentioned flood mechanics last time that it is basically a science that deals with action of forces on fluids. So, and I mentioned several systems that we can look at and, um, you know, require to do some analysis when we are actually trying to understand how these system operates or if we have a problem in this system, how can we fix it? So some of these uh, uh, Activity requires some kind of some understanding of flood mechanics, and I mentioned that fluids can be um, um, can be class. I'm not sure if people are still asking some questions here, so I, forgive me if I'm not looking at the chat. But uh, let's focus for for now on uh, the stuff that I need to discuss uh, today. So I, I mentioned to you like last time that we have uh, gas and liquid are defined under the category of fluid mechanics. And we mentioned that fluids are defined in a certain way uh, that is different from solids. Uh, under the fluid mechanics subject, you will see um, hydrodynamics and you will see gas dynamics, aerodynamics, and all these topics are related to some operational aspects and, and some condition and limitations. So hydrodynamic is only dealing with liquids or maybe sometime you uh, later on in the graduate school, you might see this hydrodynamic applied to some gases, but moving at a very low uh, velocity. But in general, it is, uh, it is you know, the analysis of uh, liquids. Gas dynamics is always uh, deal with gases and I'm talking here about high speed flows and gas and nozzles and rockets and, you know, and combustion engine and so on, right? So the area of fluid mechanics, uh, uh, is also deal with aerodynamics, so fluid passing over like, you know, bodies and, uh, and in, in, in these cases, like, you know, we're talking about aircrafts and rockets and, and so on. So in our course, we're going to basically discuss two important aspects of fluids. So we're going to discuss fluid statics because we need to understand forces uh, and how these forces of coming from the fluid affecting, you know, uh, those systems. 
And um, the second important part in this course will be talking about fluid dynamics. And in the fluid dynamics, we're going to look into um, forces, but also motion of uh, fluids in this system. And how can we describe this fluid motion? Uh, and how can we use uh, simple analysis to uh, look at the system um, either from a design perspective, if we need to design something or a circuit of uh, that has fluids uh, flowing in, in them, or if we need to look at the system that is already designed, but there are some problem or right. So we, you know, all this will will uh, will get into in, in this course. So I mentioned last time matters is uh, classified under three uh, category in as you uh, all know in the high school physics solid, liquid, and gases, okay? One of the very important aspects when we're looking at gases here and solid and liquids, we are mainly uh, classifying this matter based on forces be you know, between the molecules. It's a very important to understand when we are discussing a topic like fluid mechanics that we are not concerned with molecules. We are not, we are not concerned with the physics and the interaction forces between this, those molecules. We are taking like, you know, a much bigger scale uh, um, approach in order to analyze the forces on these uh, on these matters. So in general, we are not concerned with particle, but those particles affecting the property of the fluid. So we know for solid, for example, forces between those molecules are very, very, very strong. And that's why solid are always con you know, considered to be like, you know, as a definite volume and a different shape, right? By, but liquids, you might see these forces are actually a little bit less and the spacing between those molecules are less. And that's why liquids are kind of, you know, it has a, it has a defined volume, like, you know, specifics, you know, certain volume, but the shape of this volume can take, you know, uh, or the, the, the volume of, of these fluid can take different shapes based on the container of this, uh, where you put these fluids. Gases is, is like, you know, on the other side, the forces will be much lower which in this case, look, you know, you'll see the particle that is actually have a very low forces between them. And, and that's why the gases will spread all over the space, right? So if you put gas in the room, the gas will try to spread all over this room, right? So it's not gonna take a certain volume or a certain shape in, in this case, but it will fill the whole room. So, and this is just a very simple uh, definition of fluid and gases. But when you are looking at the fluids here, I, I, you know, I just, put this picture here to, so you can understand this. Like, you know, when you have a solid, we are looking at, you know, a certain shape of these, uh, of these solids. So when you apply some forces, so let me just activate this. So when you apply some forces here, you basically change the volume of, uh, sorry, change the, the shape of the solid, but maybe the volume will stay the same. For liquid here, if you put it in a different container, it will take different shape and gas will be, um, as I mentioned, it will spread all over uh, around. We're gonna get into much more detail about like, you know, um, uh, how like, you know, the surface of the liquid is maintain its shape like this uh, later on when we're talking about the surface tension uh, later on in this chapter. But in general, like, you know, when you are looking into general definition of fluid mechanics, you will hear this. Fluid is defined as a substance that will continuously deform under any applied shear stress, regardless of the magnitude of these shear stress. It's a very important theory, you know, it's a very simple definition, but we have to really build some understanding what is this definition is actually means. Why people start looking into gas and liquids and we put them together under one category that is, is basically describing here. It will continuously deform under any applied shear stress, okay? So let me just go a little bit, one step back here and, and explain something very important. So when we have an element, let's say this element is like that. Very simple element here. And let's assume now this is kind of a solid piece, right? And let's say, sorry, this is an area, right? So this is like, you know, this area here. 
I, if I apply a certain force on this area, let's say F1, okay, I hope you see this. So um, F1 is like, you know, you've, you've taken solid mechanics and, and mechanics one, and so it dealt with forces on, on surfaces. So very important everyone understand very well what is it, what does the stress mean, right? So we know that the stress is defined by force over area, right? But it's very important to understand the different type of stresses, okay? So when we are looking at force like this, and this force, let's say it is applied over this area with a 90 degree angle, okay? So this force, we call it normal force to the area, okay? And let's say this is now uh, area A and this force F. So the stress actually applied by this force is defined as sigma, which is basically this force one over area. And this stress sigma here is defined as a normal stress. Okay. And every time we are talking about the force here, we say something called the line of action of this force. Where is this force is actually applying and in which direction? So if this force is acting into the surface, normal to the surface, we call it like, you know, a compression stress. If this force is actually act, act, acting in, in the opposite direction, out away from the surface, but the line of action here is normal to the surface, we call it like, you know, tensile stresses, right? So we, we, we're all familiar with these normal stresses. Now, if I, if I take the same maybe force here or maybe a different force and I apply it in this direction, so let's say F2, okay, we say that, okay, the stress that is created by this F2 is something called tau, and the tau here is a shear stress. So the F2 over the same area, and you see here the same area, but now the force is, is parallel to the surface right it is tangential to this direction of uh, you know uh, in this line of action so basically this force is creating a shear force or a shear stress sorry that is defined by f2 over the area right so we call this is basically okay so you might remember in the mechanics when we are actually looking, let's say I'm taking now a, a you know, a, a simple This is F2 and now I'm just taking the projected, you know, uh, plan for this. If this is solid, what's going to happen here? So yes, there is a shear stress applied to this uh, solid material. Might you know if it's you know if it's large enough, it will basically deflect this surface in this direction. Okay. So the idea here is we're talking about a shear stress over a solid, and the solid is kind of resisting this, right? Resisting the you know the shear stress. And what happened in this case, you know, if you remove this force. So what do you think about this surface? Like, let's say, for example, a deflection angle here, delta, for example, okay? So, and this is a solid. So now if you are removing this force, if you just remove, you, you know, the force from uh, 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 over this element, what will happen to the solid material? Yes. Exactly. It will, you know, it will return to its original shape in under one condition. Okay. It will return to its original shape if the strengths or the stresses applied doesn't make any permanent deformation, right? So it will go back. If we are talking about like, you know, these stresses is within the elastic region of the solid, you know, uh, strengths of this material, right? Or it will keep parts, right? It will keep part of this deflection or deformation, right? You might just go maybe like here, if you put like so much force here that is goes into the plastic deformation kind of thing, okay? Why I'm saying all this? Because this is completely different when you are talking about fluids. Okay, and I mentioned flow, it could be gas or liquid. So let's 
let's consider now same amount of material, but now it is liquid. And in order to do this, let me just imagine now I have, okay. I have this element here. And now this is fluid. Of course, for gases, it will be very hard to explain this, but let's assume that this is basically a liquid, right? And this liquid is like that. And in order to apply a shear stress on this liquid, let's assume that we are putting maybe a plate here, it has the same area, okay? And now I'm putting force here, right? And now I'm applying a shear stress on these fluids. So what will happen here, you know, there's gonna be some deformation here, right? Similar to the other material. And what happened if I remove this force now? You might, you know, you might try this, like, you know, if you have a certain, like if you, if you are in a pool or something and you have a, a floating, you know, uh, uh, plate here, and you start acting, you know, putting some force, you know, parallel to the surface of the liquid or the water. And now you remove your uh, your hand or you remove the force. What will happen? Exactly, it will it would continue, right? You will see that actually, you know, even by removing the force, there's going to be more motions even after you're removing, you know. Right, so you're gonna be removing your force, but it will like the fluid will start even moving more. Right, this is not happening in the solids. Solid will will stop maybe if it's completely a plastic deformation. Go back to the original space if it's an elastic deformation, slightly even less if it's within still the plastic deformation. But fluid will act completely different. And fluid, what I mean, fluid here is gas and liquid. So when we go back to the original description of, you know, uh, 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 fluids, is it's continuously deformed under any applied shear stress, regardless of the magnitude of this stress. So even with a very little amount of shear stresses, shear stresses, right? There's going to be some deformation. And that's why when you put the liquid in a container, it will kind of, you know, the particle will move, you know, with respect to each other in order to fill the shape of this container. Same thing for gas, it will just spread all over the place because any small little amount of shear stresses will keep basically uh, uh, moving the fluid. okay? So this is very important. And, and again, I'm stressing on this because this is, this is what fluid means, right? So you have to really consider um, this understanding when you are actually looking into the analysis of uh, fluid mechanics. So now, later on, somebody will ask, you know, if I have a solid material and I melt it down into liquid, for example, liquid molten metal, for example, right? Is it going to be acting the same or not? It will, if it will, you know, acting based on this definition, it's going to be a fluid in this case, but it's going to be a different kind of fluid, right? So molten metal, when they are creating steel and stuff like that, it is still like, you know, some of the, you know, some of the analysis for these molten metals and stuff has to go along with some understanding of fluid flow. But this fluid here will be, we'll call it like something called non-Newtonian fluid. And this is later on, we're going to explain it very well. I hope this is clear. Okay. Um, so fluid property and, and uh, you know, in any subject, we are dealing with some parameters in, in, uh, in this course. And uh, in order to understand this parameter and how this parameter is actually uh, related to each other and how this parameter is used in order to be part of a solution uh, um, methodology for any engineering problem, we have to understand how, what is the properties, what is these parameters are, okay? There are one important topic related to fluid mechanics called continuum mechanics. Okay, and this continuum mechanics is, is by itself is a, a whole like, you know, topic. That's not our maybe focus in this course, but at least you have to understand from the continuum here and why you consider fluid as continuum, because we, we assume that the property within like, you know, the fluid uh, element or, or like the fluid container, you know, uh, that we are analyzing, the property was within this whole fluid is not changing dramatically, okay? 
So if you go, for example, here, and this is fluid, at any point in this system here, the property is not changing from, you know, you know one value to a, a completely different value. And if there is a change, that change will be smooth. It will be like some gradient for this change, right? So, and of course, I'm not talking here about like, you know, uh, a typical type of fluids, but, you know, let's say, for example, water, when I start heating the water, you see some kind of, you know, variation, like, you know, the hot fluids will go up, right? And the cold will go down. There are some circulation within these fluids. Of course, this is what is going to happen because the property of the fluid will keep changing. Like, for example, here, when we are looking at the oceans, we all the time, like, you know, the top part of, uh, of the ocean will be basically the hot part, the, the bottom part will be the cold. And why, why this? Because the density of the, you know, of the hot uh, water will basically less than uh, the density of the cold water. So when I'm talking about continuum here, I'm talking about variation in the, you know, uh, in the property, but not dramatic changes in this, right? And um, in the continuum mechanics, we consider large enough volume such as the spacing of molecule levels is to the order of minus uh, 10 to the minus nine millimeter cube. This we're talking about a very small little um, uh, control volume uh, approach. So in our course, we're going to consider all the material or the fluid that we are handling are, uh, you know, satisfying the continuum mechanics uh, assumptions. So the continuum mean here is when I give you a fluid in a problem, the density or the property of this uh, um, fluid is uh, approximately the same all over, um, you know, um, the volume of these fluids. So, um, so every fluid has a property, as I mentioned, and this physical property, understanding this physical property is very important to understand, right? And all these property are a combination of, um, you know, a basic dimensions, like, you know, uh, lens, mass, force, time, temperature, right? So when we are talking or describing a certain physical property of the fluid, it's going to be part of, you know, uh, uh, a combination of lens and mass and force and time and so on. Right, and uh, I'm sure that in every other course you, you talk about system of units and dimensions. Why we every time we are talking about like you know different subjects, we are starting with you know talking about the you know units and dimensions. I know now there is a lot of uh, online tool that you can convert property. Uh, you know. Let's say, for example, lens in meter converted to feet, for example, or stuff like that. But why? Why it's important to keep reminding every student about, like you know, the importance of units and dimensions. Anyone has any idea? Why are you spending our time just talking about this units and dimensions? Anyone? So it's basically. Yeah, it's help with the mass. Yeah, sure. That's not the best uh, answer I'd like to hear, but consistency calculation, perfect. Yeah. Uh, but what, yeah, make mistakes in real life. I like that. You know, the most important thing about units and dimension have some sense of the quantity, right? You're going to be an engineer walking around facility. And you're gonna be like looking at, you know, let's say for example, a pressure dial, and you see that dial is like, you know, 50 psi. Okay. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, you know, a dial that is talking about like you know, 20 bar, or another dial that is talking about like, you know, 500 megapascal, right? The most important thing here is some, you have to have some sense of, you know, of, uh, of the quantity, right? Is that a high pressure or this is a low pressure? Right. So what I mean here, like, you know, the conversion part is very easy because you can have software, you can have online tool that to convert from another, one unit to another unit. But the most important thing for this course, I want you to have some kind of, you know, understanding and feeling about the numbers because the number, the value of the number is actually has a lot of implication about your safety inside, like, you know, a facility that is, uh, you know, this line is a very high pressure, let's say steam at this, like, you know, 200 megapascal, that's a very high pressure, right? So you have to understand what is this, 
what is the value of, what is the implication of, you know, rupture in this pipe, right? Same thing when you are actually designing, you know, uh, uh, small little carpentry, you know, piece, like, you know, the inches and millimeter and like, you know, the meter, right? So you have a sense of units in terms of lengths. You have to have the same thing when you are actually dealing with fluids in systems. What is a flow rate? Is it like gallon per, 50 gallon per minute? Is that much or low and, and so on? So that's why I, I spend some time every, um, in this course, in thermodynamics and every other course talking about units and dimension related to this course. And I ask the TA to really go over um, some, you know, simple calculations for you in, um, uh, in the tutorial session uh, this week. So basic dimensions, uh, we know all these basic dimension is we call it primary dimensions. So three dimensions that we use in order to, you know, uh, describe any physical property in addition to the temperature. So of course, this course is like, you know, is not dealing with heating and, and so on, but it will always refer to condition of the fluid at a certain temperature because temperature will change the property. As I mentioned about density, for example, which is going to, I'm going to explain in the, you know, in the next few slides. But mass, length, time, temperature are our like basic dimensions. Okay. Secondary dimensions are the derived from this primary dimension. Like for example, velocity. We know that velocity is length per time, right? So how much distance per time? So it is a basically a dimension of um, of the length divided by the dimension of the time. Okay. We know uh, pressure is a stress, right? Normal stress. So it's going to be forces divided by area. And the forces are, it's a mass times acceleration. So basically all these secondary dimension will be a combination of all these basic dimensions. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this is like, you know, um, very clear uh, from different other uh, subjects as well. Energy, volume, and other things, right? And why this, we are interested in these two systems? Because these two systems of the English system and the metric system are very commonly used in many uh, industry, right? So you will see um, the English system, which is, you know, basically the United States um, system that is dealing with bound and, you know, dealing with BTU for the for the energy, you're dealing with feet and other things, right? While the metric system is dealing with um, uh, the meter and the seconds and the kilogram and, and so on, right? It's very important to know how to convert from one to another. I mentioned conversion here is going to be the easiest way to do. Like, you know, there's a lots of online tools. You can just put the number and you just like see, okay, from what dimension to what dimension and it will give you the answer. But my, uh, my important uh, advice to you here is to have a, some sense of, you know, um, uh, those units when you are looking at the numbers, because those numbers are very important to have um, a sense of if this is big or small, or this is a logical number or not, and so on, right? This will help you to, um, and some of these conversion units, uh, and again, this is my advice, if you become an engineer working on lots of flow rates and pressures and stuff, those number has to be in your head and your mind, because all the time you would try to have a sense of, you know, the number as you walk around, uh, around an engineering facility, okay? So uh, the primary unit I mentioned in the SI unit is meter uh, for the lens, kilogram for the mass, and second for the time. And uh, of course, I mentioned to you, like, you know, the second one will be uh, volume, for example, meter cube, acceleration meter per second, forces kilogram meter per second square, right? And, and I hope this is like, you know, I'm not wasting your time here, but those are a very simple uh, um, uh, secondary units that we're going to be dealing with in this course, right? Pressure, uh, sometimes we call it like, you know, it's a Newton per meter and Newton here is defined as the, the force, right? And the force here is kilogram meter per second square, which is equal to one Newton, for example. Uh, work is like Newton uh, times meter. It's a force uh, with distance, uh, right? So basically, sometimes we call it joule, for example, right? Uh, gravitational acceleration for the SI unit is 9.81. And the temperature in the SI unit is uh, defined in degree Celsius or the degree Kelvin in the absolute term. 
for the absolute scale. And this will be defined much more in detail in the thermodynamics course, why we are referring to in uh, the absolute uh, temperature instead of like, you know, the series is temperature, okay? I'm gonna go through this very quickly and in order to get to the point uh, we're trying to explain in this course. Same thing happened for the British system. I want you to be familiar with those numbers. Are you gonna have some tool in order to use? I mentioned you're gonna have like an open book, you can just use a conversion table and stuff, but please try as much as you can to have some number in your head about those parameters. So at least you understand is those numbers are reasonable when you are solving problem uh, or those number are logical and, and, and so on, right? But again, as I mentioned, information is available everywhere and conversion unit is available everywhere. But for example, PSI, PSI is units for um, uh, pressure. You will see it a lot, right? As you go on many stations, many facility, power generation, like, you know, even like, you know, sometime in, uh, in, your, uh, in your house, when you're looking at your heating system and stuff like if there is some pressure sensor, it will give you the PSI, right? Bound per square inch, right? Uh, sometimes it's called uh, bound per square feet. Uh, like, you know, if uh, I think this is wrong when I mentioned bound per feet square, this is in general, but you know, if the feet is converted to inch, it will be something called BSI, okay? And the gravitation acceleration here will be 32.2 feet per square, uh, square uh, seconds. You have any I don't do you have any no clear heights uh some people are talking uh, to each other which is like okay that's fine anyway so that's good so at least you know if there's somebody in feet or meter he knows exactly if he's short or tall stuff like that okay the dimension and unit dimension this is what we uh, we have for this course uh, mass length time and temperature and as i am pretty sure it are um, those are the only four uh, for these different properties. One, um, one important thing also, um, I wanna make sure that you guys understand. I know this is very simple and lots of people know, but having some homogeneous dimension when you are solving problem, okay? So let me ask you first now, there is a problem in the, these equations. Somebody is solving and in the middle of the solution, this is the energy and he is actually getting the number, calculating the numbers, right? And uh, he found some problem, uh, you know, in, in these equations. What do you think about the first equation? Exactly, right? Adding something with different rate, it doesn't make sense. Perfect, okay? So the first, the first equation is 25 kilojoule plus seven kilojoule per kilogram. That doesn't make sense, right? Units has to be consistent when you are adding things. You cannot really add apple to orange and then just like, right, get the total number. So basically you have to basically consider when you are actually solving problem. And this problem included like, you know, you know, adding different terms in the equation. You have to make sure that this is consistent unit. Okay. So the first one is basically is wrong. And the second one, the same thing, right? It's kilojoule and then the plus seven kilometer per kilogram doesn't make sense, right? Units are very important too. So basically here, this is not, right? One, uh, one additional thing I wanna make sure that you guys understand, like, you know, for example, if we have a hundred bound uh, feet per second square, how many bound force do you have? And you know the numbers here, you know, the conversion, let's say, for example. So we know that the bound force is 32.174 bound mass feet per second square. We know the conversion number, right? But now we have a hundred of this, hundred of bound mass feet per second square. How much is this in bound force, right? I know you are excellent in this, but let me just explain to you now. So 100, so one bound force from this equation here. Is equal to 32.174, right? Bound mass feet 
the second square, right? Now I have I have a hundred of this. How much x of this bound force? Okay. Excellent. Some people already calculated this. Yeah, it's very simple. Perfect. Okay. All the time, you can do this very simple cross relation, right? So basically, so 32.174x is equal to 100. And now we try to find x. So x is equal to 100. I know I'm trying to be like, you know, very simple here, but you don't know how many people of you, if you will make these mistakes, right? So this will be three point, you know, one zero eight as some of you were writing. Excellent, right? And this will be bound force, right? And significant digit for here, for example, if I tell you, for example, just use only two uh, significant digits. So this eight here is higher than the five. So that means basically I can write it down this way. So this would be a much better engineering, right? So it depends on the application for sure, right? How much accurate, uh, you know, data that you want. But if I'm asking you to write your number based on the second significant digit, you can just like, you know, approximate this number. So excellent, right? So everybody's getting this idea here. Unit's conversion, and I mentioned to you that this is available in the textbook, available in online. Many units for different systems can be found. Volume, velocity, acceleration, pressure, right? This is all the you know property that we're gonna look into uh, in this course. And many times we're gonna talk about uh, those property in addition to stuff related specific to fluid mechanics, density, viscosity, and uh, specific volume and so on, as we're gonna explain in in a few seconds. So density is the first uh, property that we're going to be uh, interested in explaining in this course. And, and density basically is describing how much mass in this volume. So if you're taking a specific volume, so this volume will be uh, consist of mo many molecules of this uh, certain type of fluid. And each molecule has a certain mass. So, and, and the distribution between these molecules will depend on gas and, and liquids. For example, liquid will have the same shape, same volume, right? So you might expect that for the same amount of volume of the liquid, let's say water, you see the same amount of mass, right? Because it's different than gases because gases can take different volume, right? So you will see same mass of the liquid will have the same volume. And that's why we call it some, sometimes something called incompressible fluid. And we're going to explain this in detail in a few seconds. But density is defined as this mass. And this is basically our volume, right? So if we're talking about the SI units here, so mass is in kilogram and volume in meter cube. So basically, this is kilogram per meter cube as the SI, unit, SI system unit for, for density. Why this is important? It is in so many application of fluid mechanics, we are using density because density of the fluid is extremely important to do all the analysis in fluid mechanics. Uh, don't see anything I need to respond in these questions. Okay, density of the fluid are more easily changed than the others, right? So density of solid, for example, it's fixed, right? Density of fluid slightly change, depend on if you are talking about gas or liquid. So let's say, for example, here, you know, you can see this table here, right? And this is a table for water at one atmosphere. So very important to note that every time we're looking at tables for fluid property, you will see, you know, temperature or pressure are given for these uh, tables. Unless it's like, you know, like, for example, in this case, you know, the, the pressure is given at one atmosphere. So all the data in this table at the same pressure, but now he's changing, you know, the temperature, right? So the temperature is increased. You see the density here is changing, right? 
So for example, here at zero degree and at one atmosphere, uh, density is 1000. You go uh, up to a 10 degree, it's still 1000. You increase the temperature, 20 degree, you will see some slight change in the density, 998. You keep changing the temperature, it is like, you know, uh, changing, uh, you know, the density as well. And the density is decreasing, right? And this is what explains what I was talking about, like, you know, the ocean or the sea level, the layer of the fluid at the top part of the ocean will have, you know, a higher temperature. And that's why there's going to be some circulations, like all the time, the, the hot water will go at the top and uh, the cold water will go at the bottom, even though it is the same fluid, it's water, right? So you will see some number changes here. But for liquid, we see this number are slightly changing, right? Of course, if you keep increasing the temperature, right? What will happen to the density after some time? Let's say, for example, one atmosphere. One atmosphere is our, you know, uh, atmospheric pressure now. Let's say different city at different elevation will have different um, value for the atmospheric pressure. But let's say, assume that the the pressure in Guelph is one atmospheric, which is equal to one bar. Let's say. Now, if, if you start putting, you know, a, a pot of water over the stove and you start increasing the temperature, what will happen after some time? Evaporation, right? First, it's going to be some boiling happening. You will see this when you are actually boiling some water on the stove. Some, you know, bubble will start and, and you'll see some motion inside this container, right? So you will see some, you know, fluid is going at the top and, you know, the fluid going in the bottom and so on. And some kind of circulations before the 100 degree, let's say. And then at the 100 degree, you know, all the fluid now has enough energy. All the particle has enough energy. And once you start increasing the temperature a little bit, what happened after that, those particles have, a, you know, a lot of heating, uh, you know, a high higher energy than like, you know, the one on the on the middle of the bot and it will escape the surface. And this is what we call it evaporation, okay? So we expect the fluid to change density based on the temperature. And that's why uh, I recommend everyone when he's looking at tables and property, make sure that you are looking into the property at the right temperature and right uh, pressure, okay? Let's just do a very simple example here. I know you guys are experts in this, but uh, let's, you know, we have a hemispherical containers, 20 inch in diameter is filled with liquid at 20 degrees C uh, and weighted. So the liquid weight is found to be 16, 17 ounces. What is the density of this fluid in kilogram per meter cube? And what the fluid might be, uh, what this fluid might just be, okay? Assume the standard gravity of 9.807, so. So we have now a hemispherical container and he's giving us the diameter, okay? And it's filled with liquid at 20 degrees C. Now in order to find out density, what are we gonna do? Okay. We know density is mass times volume, right? Looks like the mass we have, the volume is given when he's mentioning that I have hemispherical container that is 26 inches, right? So it looks like I need to get, uh, first I need to get the volume, right? So the volume of this container will be what? Hemispherical, right? So we have half of the sphere and the sphere volume is by over six d cube, right? And I know the, the diameter of this container to be 26 inches. First of all, we have to make sure that, you know, we try to get all the number in the SI unit because you need to find out the density in kilogram per meter cube. So we have to consider like, you know, conversion as we go in solving the problem, right? So now I have half of this, so I have half and by over six. And the diameter here is 26 inches. 
cube. So if I calculated this, it will be four, six, zero, one. This cheating here from my sheet, inch cube, right? In order to convert this into um, meter cube. Okay. Four, six, zero, one. And in order to convert it to, you know, I know in the inch is point zero two five four right meter. So I can say that it's point zero two five four meter, right? But remember, this is actually cube, right? So if you do this cube, that means basically you have also to multiply this number. So in this case, we have zero seven five four meter cube. Doesn't matter as long as you do it. Yeah, it looks like people are responding to each other. So anyway, it's very simple stuff, right? But just make sure that when you are actually converting, you pay attention to the square, the cube, and like you know where these units are converted. So we know that now I have a volume of this value. Okay. Sorry, Professor. Do you mind zooming Sorry. out? Sorry. Do you mind zooming out? I can't hear you well. Zoom out? Yes. Do you mind zooming oh, out? Like this? Or just go out of the zoom? I don't know. I mean, like this one? To see the to see the, the question. Oh, the question, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. So now we are calculating the volume. Yeah, I get carried out by the solving the problem. I, I hope everybody is following what I'm saying. Okay. So it is a very simple problem, but the only small little thing that you have to consider here is small little unit dimensions, uh, conversion, and, and so on, right? So I have the volume now. If I find that also the mass, right i can find out the density so mass is is weighted to be 16 17 ounces okay if you go and check out the, the conversion table for this it looks like i have to divide by 16 in order to convert it to bound mass so it looks like 16, 17 ounces, you divide it by 16, this will give you 101 bound mass. Okay. And in order to convert it from bound mass to kilogram, so we know that the bound mass, this is 101. If I want to remove this bound mass, I can replace it by 0.4. 539, and you can see me here, I'm cheating from, a, you know, something that mean you don't have to remember all these small little numbers over bound mass, and this is kilogram. Okay. So 0.4539 kilogram is equal to bound mass, right? So in this case, I can just get this number here as 45 points. 84 kilogram. Yeah, yes, I'm using a cheat sheet because I want to concentrate on that topic, not uh, the numbers now. Okay. So anyway, uh, you have the mass, you have the volume, so you can calculate the density. Right. So if I can add another page here, so liquid density. Is equal to M over V and this will be 45.84.0754. This will give you 607. 
kilogram per meter cube. So it's asking you to find out liquid density first, right? And then find out what is the type of this fluid is, okay? So remember that this is at 20 degrees C, right? Uh, it looks like I have a density that is 607, and I don't know what this fluid is. I can for sure go into property table and find out like, you know, what is this, right? So if you look at this table A3 and you know at the end of this textbook, it's just showing different you know, fluids. And in this case will be liquids, right? And you'll see densities are listed on, for for the you know for different uh, fluids. And it looks like you know it's very close to this number here. So I can say that this is basically ammonia. Okay. Perfect. So people are solving with me, which is excellent. People are tracking me for the numbers, which is amazing, right? So, so these are the typical type of, uh, you know, uh, simple problem to find out properties and stuff like that. For gases, like, you know, I, I, I know like, you know, in, the, in, in your uh, physics um, uh, course, you've taken like, you know, something called ideal gas equation. And the ideal gas equation is, you know, something like this. I hope you remember this from your physics course in high school, right? And it is basically like, you know, it's talking about something called ideal gas. So there's some property for, you know, for gases that we assume ideal gas and those ideal gas, like for example, air, nitrogen, basic type of gases, some other gases will, will be real gases and, and what is the difference between real gases and ideal gases and stuff like that. This will be a different topic for different course. But in our, our case, you know, for this course is we're dealing with simple gases. We're talking about ideal gases. One thing I want you to remember when we are talking about this ideal gas equation, it is relating pressure, volume, mass, and temperature. So it's gonna be some variation of these parameters, but because gases are, you know, much more simpler than liquids. And uh, if you remember our previous example, when I ask you, when we are increasing the temperature, what will happen to the liquid? You said it's gonna evaporate, right? Uh, and before that, it's gonna be boiling and the boiling is a different phase. So sometimes you have the liquid changing its phase from liquid phase to vapor phase and so on. That's not happening in the gases. So gas is much more simpler than that. So if you are increasing the temperature of gases, and if you are assuming the ideal gas equation, it is basically, you know, can be controlled by this ideal gas equation. And if I look at, you know, BV equal uh, MRT, right? I can take this V and put it down here, right? And I can take this RT and put it down there. So it's basically M over V equal to P over RT. And what is MV is basically our density, right? One important thing to remember when we are looking at this equation, this R here, and this mass here is very important to know that this is a mass of, you know, the volume that you are talking about in the mass. And this R is the gas constant. Okay, so I have, for example, one kilogram of air in this container or this tank. What will, and the pressure is that much, the temperature increase, so on, right? So this is a total mass of the matter in, in, inside your system. And R here is a specific gas constant, okay? How this is different from something called molecular mass is gonna be some, you know, relation between, you know, the gas constant R and the universal gas constant. 
And this is what we call it the molecular weight, right? It's actually given here. Right? So we know that there is a molecular weight for different type of gases. We, if you remember, for example, for oxygen, the 16, nitrogen, 28, stuff like that, right? But we only needed this molecular weight if we have the reversal gas constant, right? In order to find out what we call it the specific gas constant R, right? In the fluid mechanics, course, like we are, as I mentioned, we are not concerned with the molecular structure of the fluid. So most of the time we are referring to specific gas constant with a specific mass. So R will be the gas constant given for different gases and the mass will be given for the whole system, right? But for people who are interested to know what is the relation, you know, you can, you can find out this relation from the molecular mass or the, you know, the periodic table for different gases. But in general, this is the equation that we're gonna use if we have uh, gases uh, in our systems. Many times in, in, in the fluid mechanics and, and later on in thermodynamics, you will see other property that is driven, you know, drive from the, you know, the basic, you know, uh, property of the fluid. You will see something called specific weight. And a specific weight here is defined as the weight per volume. So instead of mass per volume, it is going to be the weight per volume. And we know that the weight is basically, it's mg, right? So in this case, it's mg divided by the volume. We know that m over v is the density. So that means the specific weight is rho times g. So it's density times, you know, uh, the gravitational acceleration, okay? And in SI units, it is basically Newton per meter uh, cube because Mg is unit for forces and the force units uh, in the SI unit is Newton, right? What unit we use in absolute pressure? Uh, that's a good question. Um, like when we are actually looking into um, gases, we're going to explain a little bit more into uh, different pressure values, and this is going to be in chapter two, right? But in gases, generally the gas equation is are defined for absolute pressure, so the pressure has to be absolute, right? We're going to talk about the absolute and gauge pressure later on in the course. Another very important uh, uh, property that we uh, refer to when we are solving fluid mechanics problem, it's something called specific volume. And when you look at the specific volume definition, it is volume per mass, okay? And it looks like very simple um, inverse of the density, right? Why we are interested in this? And I will, you know, as we go in the course, you will see some time when we are driving some relations and stuff, you will you will see a lot of the density on the uh, dominator or the inverse of density. So just for convenience, we refer this as to a specific volume. So a specific volume are defined as volume over uh, the mass. Because we have uh, very super fluids, like, you know, uh, water, for example, is one of the uh, very common fluid used in many applications. So in this case, we are referring to uh, some property with respect to the property of the water. This property called the specific gravity. Uh, why do we call it specific? To just to differentiate it from the volume, okay? So specific uh, gravity here is, is a relation between density of the matter we have or the fluid we have over the density of a reference fluid, okay? And because gas and liquid are different, because we know that we explain a little bit, like, you know, volume of the gas will take, you know, uh, many, sorry, mass of the gas will take many different volumes, different from the liquid, because liquid is a little bit, we call it has almost, almost the same volume, right? So that's why we have to differentiate between gases and liquid when you are looking at densities, okay? Specific uh, uh, gravity here is 
a specific gravity for gas is the, the density of gas divided by the density of air at the standard condition. What do you mean standard condition here? Condition is a standard atmospheric and temperature, right? So at a certain temperature and pressure, which is our atmospheric pressure and temperature. For liquid, the same thing. So specific gravity for liquid will be the density for any liquid divided by 20 degrees. Yeah. I know, I know this is slightly, you know, different, but imagine now standard condition for Guelph is slightly different from standard condition of Alberta, you know, some city in Alberta, for example, Kelowna, for example, in Alberta, because the height and, the, you know, um, the elevation of the city and so on, right? But in general, like, you know, you will see most of the stuff given in this textbook is, is taking one standard city and say, okay, 20 degrees C is your standard temperature. And pressure is 1.013 uh, kilo newton per uh, uh, meter square of pressure, right? We're gonna, we get, we're gonna get a lot into, into this as we go, but this is, this is very nice questions. Uh, Kilona is in BC professor? Yeah, I guess, I don't know. I just hear I have a friend of mine who's there, so. Or Alberta, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Forgive me all this uh, uh, geographical knowledge, but uh, haven't uh, haven't traveled a lot uh, in Canada. But anyway, uh, specific gravity is uh, dimensionless because basically uh, it is ratio between density and density. So we can imagine that this is basically a dimensionless quantity. Many times you'll see, like you know, the specific gravity given for. Um, uh, for for liquids, uh, especially oils, it will tell you, okay, I have an oil of a specific gravity 0 0.8. What does it mean? It is It means like the density is about 800, let's say, because density of the water is 1,000 approximately. So now the density of this oil that is specific gravity 0 0.8, it is basically going to be 800. Right. Another important property, again, I'm just listing um, uh, properties uh, of fluid and we're gonna ap appreciate what is each quantity means and what is the significance of dealing with each quantity as we go in the course, right? Uh, one of the very important property you ha I have to explain here is something called compressibility. This compressibility is adding to our understanding about like difference between gas and liquids. That's a very important uh, property. So when the pressure on a given mass of fluid increase, the fluid contract resulting in increase in density. You are pushing, you know, the particle to come close to each other, right? Of course, like, you know, for gases, it's very simple to uh, imagine, right? So let's say, for example, for gases, if I have a piston, And this is a volume, and let's say this is air. And if I apply force here, I can basically say that I'm moving this. So instead of this whole volume, it's becoming only this volume here, right? You can change a lot uh, in the gases. When you are applying forces, you can change, you know, the, um, the volume of the gases at, for the same mass. So when I, you know, when I put this volume here, this volume has a certain, a certain mass, right? So if you increasing, or if you are pushing this piston down, you're changing this volume from this whole thing into this, right? So you're changing a lot in the volume, but this is for gases. How about for liquids? It's gonna be different, right? Resistance to change the volume will be uh, much more different than uh, for gases. That's why we have to define something called um, a compressibility, because compressibility, um, yeah, people are asking questions, uh, just jumping into, just, I'm, I'm still doing, I'm still explaining this, right? Uh, V1, I'm gonna talk about V1. Okay, so, uh, 
we have to define numbers so we can refer to these numbers as the compressibility of these fluids. Okay, so sometimes we call it the elasticity, right? Often called the compressibility of the fluid described by the bulk modulus of elasticity given by EV. Okay, and EV is referring to delta B, the change in the pressure. divided by but we are referring to the percentage or like you know the relative the change in pressure and relative here relative to v1 and v1 here we can refer to as the initial volume for example so if you change the you know the pressure from B1 to B2, the volume will change from B1 to V2. And we can say, for example, V1 here or B1 here, your initial conditions, right? So in this case, we have to refer to uh, you know a certain reference pressure and, and, and volume and now we increase the pressure what will happen to the volume it is all related by something called the compressibility or the bulk modulus of elasticity for these fluids and the number here uh, is the front here is going to be a negative sign and this negative sign is referring to anyone Yeah, compression, yes. But it's, it is a relation between pressure difference and volume difference. And we know all the time this relation will be in the negative value. Why? Because the increase of pressure will followed by a decrease of the volume, right? Which means that delta B and delta V are always have a negative sign. And this negative sign is already accounted for in this you know, relation, right? So my point here is all the time when you are calculating or using this equation, use the same order between uh, uh, B and V. What I mean by the same order. So EV here will be minus, and this, if I say B2 minus B1, It has to be V2 minus V1. Okay, so you have to use the same order. Don't worry about like, you know, which one is small and which one is high because initial pressure, let's say for example, the pressure initially was a hundred, you know, bar or a hundred kilopascal and it changed to instead of hundred become 50. So the pressure decrease. So the volume will increase, right? Don't worry about all this. You can just like, you know, once you have this negative sign here, remember that you can use this equation, but just keep this order of pressure same way as volume here, okay? And of course, because the units of volume over volume has no dimension, the units is pressure here that mean the bulk modulus of elasticity here will have the same units of the pressure, which is Newton per meter square for the SI, you know, SI units. And sometimes we call it Pascal, okay? So you can see here, this is our uh, given relation. So units here could be sometime referred to as Pascal. Okay. And this is in the side of it. Okay. So let's, let's go over, a, a, you know, a simple exercise here, but the most important thing about this exercise 
is not because how to use the equation in order to solve this problem. It is giving you some idea about like, you know, how the water is actually uh, behaving when you are applying a certain forces on uh, or a certain pressure increase. Um, um, and this pressure increase here, you'll see one meter cube of water at atmospheric pressure. And let's say atmospheric pressure here for this given location is one kilonewton uh, per meter square. Okay. This volume is uh, now subjected to a uh, pressure of a thousand kilonewton per meter square. So, t t you know, a thousand times. So you have initial pressure of one and then, it you know, the pressure increased thousand times. The bulk modulus of elasticity of water is 2.2 giganewton per meter square. So giganewton here means 10 to the bar, right? Six in, in, in this case. So uh, find the percentage change in the volume of water. So in this case, I have V1 is one meter cube. V1 is one. Okay, and I have V2 is not known, V2 is uh, a thousand. The bulk of modulus of elasticity is given, find the percentage change in the volume of the water. He asked about the percentage change of the volume of water. Okay, so this percentage change in the volume of water could be referred to as Delta V over V1 and V1 here, how much it changed with respect to the initial volume. And this could be, you know, uh, uh, obtained in terms of percentage. Okay. So in this case, I have EV is minus delta V over delta V over V1, or it could be minus here and then. We can decide, let's say B2 minus B1. So it will be V2 minus V1 divided by V1. Remember that we have to you know, take care of the units. So the units here is 2.2 giga Newton per meter square. So in order, in order to make sure that everything is in same units, so I can just put this 2.6 times 10 to the bar six. This is Newton per meter square equal to negative. And B2 is a thousand minus the initial uh, pressure, which is one. So V2 minus V1 over V1. Looks like, you know, he's asking about the percentage of volume uh, relative to the uh, initial volume. But if he is only asking for the second volume, I can. Oh, Giga, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sorry. Talk about Mega. Okay. So in this case, I have um, um, 2.2. I like those guys. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, yeah, I'm jumping, my mind is jumping into other things. Uh, so basically, what I'm trying to say here is like, sometime we're asking about the second volume, for example. Okay. Uh, yeah, people uh, discussing here, unit stuff. Yeah, it is Newton. Yes, sure. Yeah, if it's kilonewton, it's going to be 10 to the bar 6 kilonewton. Sure. Perfect. So in this case, I have to multiply here by a thousand because this is a, a thousand kilonewton. Okay, so you know where I'm coming from now. Okay, so let me go back to my uh, initial thought. He's asking about percentage change in the volume of the water, right? So it, in order to get the percentage of the volume, right, all the time percentage change is referred to like. A, you know, when you're asking about like, you know, what will be the change in the volume, it is always referring to uh, some initial reference value. So I need 2% change or 5% change or so on, right? This is what we are looking for in this uh, problem. 
uh, excellent, uh, you know, uh, following up with this. So because we need to make sure that all the onus is correct. So giga Newton, right? So I need to find out this value here, right? So I can calculate this. And this V2 minus V1 over V1, or this delta V over V1 is equal to the 999 over 2.6 to the power nine, or you know what I mean? I'm sorry. Yeah. Right? So this will be minus zero, 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 four, five. Okay. The most important thing in, in this problem here to see this, how this significant, uh, the number is a very small number. And if you, multi if you multiply this by 100, you can get this value as a percentage. So it's minus 0.45%. Okay. So we are talking about like a big change in the, you know, in the pressure of a thousand times from, uh, you know, one kilo Newton or to a thousand kilo Newton, thousand times the volume change from the initial volume is even less than 0.1%. That's why we consider water as incompressible, okay? So huge change in the pressure is not changing the volume with a significant value, very small. But is it changing? Yes, changing, right? So the, the volume changing, but the thing here is this percentage change is a very small, given this very high pressure. In many engineering applications, you don't see this huge change in the pressure in a system like this, right? But, but incompressibility here is very important uh, property to the liquids in general. I mean, like, you know, we uh, apply this to water for uh, in this problem, but when you do the same thing for other oils and stuff like that, you will see that lots of, uh, uh, you know, of these liquids can be uh, uh, assumed as an incompressible fluid. Okay. And based on that, you will see like, you know, for example, transmission of the forces, like, you know, why we don't use compressed air, for example, in the braking system of the car. We only use like liquids, right? And this is oil, you know, and this oil of a, you know, has a certain property that will transmit forces without, you know, uh, changing the, you know, uh, the volume inside uh, inside the system. So in this case, um, liquid is meant for um, hydraulic transmissions, for example, for forces and so on. The second topic, uh, maybe I will stop here this time. I will let you absorb all the other parts and, and we'll start next time talking about the viscosity. This is a, another very important topic in, uh, in the first chapter. And viscosity is, uh, understanding viscosity is very important in many application of um, uh, using fluid mechanics analysis. So next time we'll maybe start at the viscosity part and uh, We'll go, we'll go by that. So I see here, uh, I see some discussions here, but I can't catch any of them. Would you consider posting the annotated notes on the course link? I will, yeah, I will, I will share with you this, uh, um, this one here. Maybe I will share with you like, you know, uh, this one. And then next time when I, uh, before the lecture, I will, I will send you the, um, the PDF of the presentation before, so if you want to make your own notes, but in all cases, I will uh, I will share also the annotated uh, part with uh, all my notes. That's no problem. Perfect. Yeah. So anything else, guys? Any questions? No problem. Okay. Take care of yourself, and I will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.
Sir. Uh, sir. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about SI units. So you're saying uh, there's primary units and then there's secondary, which is comprised of primary. Uh, what if yep. there's a unit that's comprised of like both? Would that be considered tertiary or is that still secondary? So like what do you mean, sorry, what the... Like if you had a unit that was comprised of primary units and secondary units, what would you call that? It's all secondary, right? Because the primary units are three. Like for example, three plus the temperature, right? So lens, oh. right? Lens right. and the mass and time. So that's that's the primary units. Any other things are secondary. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, guys. Yes, I will post the slide before the lectures. No problem. Hi, I just have a question for you. Yeah. Um, is water considered incompressible because it has strong intramolecular forces? Sure. Yeah, that's that's a that's a much more physical you know explanation for this. We we try to relate it to uh, bulk moles of elasticity, but uh, as I mentioned in the, you know in the beginning, you know there are some other term that is talking about physics and molecules, which is I'm trying to avoid in this case, but uh, but you were right. Okay, thank you. That yeah, makes sense. Got it. A uh, quick question, because someone asked it, but I don't think you saw it in the chat. It was early in the lecture. Does um does does the thing he just said is water incompressible? Does it have anything to do with the surface tension too, or is it more just the forces? Does, Nothing. It's forces. Does the surface it's tension affect anything regarding water? Because like when you mentioned, uh, when you mentioned putting a plate on the water or putting something on the water, that's that got me thinking about surface tension a little. Surface tension is only talking about like you know the top layer of particles of the of the fluid, right? Uh, and we we like in the second part of this chapter we're gonna talk about surface tension separately. But when you are talking about compressibility here, compressibility is related to volume and density, and that's it. Has nothing but if to do you with put something, but if, but if you put something on top of the water that the surface tension can hold up, doesn't that affect the compressibility? Uh, compressibility has nothing to do with this. The surface tension forces, right? When you start boiling, for example, if you put this sheet for, uh, of, you know, uh, on the top of the surface and you try to boil it up a little bit, right? You will see there are some forces that are affecting this, right? But it doesn't mean it is changing the volume of the fluid. The volume of the fluid will not change by these forces. So surface tension forces are much very small values. Uh, when you are actually referring to the com uh, compressibility. So it has nothing to do with compressibility. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Asalaamu Alaikum. I go salam. Bye. Compressibility affected by temperature? Yes. That's why uh, those numbers are given in this problem are at uh, standard conditions. And you will see compressibility are given uh, in the table uh, at a certain uh, temperature and pressure, uh, sorry, at a certain temperature, because pressure is uh, is part of the definition of the compressibility. So, any more questions? Um, sorry, when will you be posting the recordings of the lecture? Uh, as soon as it's like, you know, it's generated because it's like it takes time to, uh, because of the size of the file. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I've seen some people over. Is still in there. So if you have any question, let me know before I close out the meeting.